Shoot, go. Huh? Go. I, I, yeah, you can go. Okay. All right, opposition to labor practices. As industry grew, um, some people are going to really benefit from large businesses. Um, as I think probably, I'm ahead of myself here, but in one of your assignments, we probably saw Robert Barron's captains of industry, people like John D. Rockefeller, Andrew Carnegie, people that made a lot of money, big businessmen. Big business during the late 1800s became actually more powerful than the government. The government would back down to them. Um, and as we would know, there's a lot of bad things going on in factories, unsafe conditions and whatnot. So some groups begin to speak out against it and oppose what's happening. Socialists are a group that oppose capitalism. So they don't like what's going on, they want it changed, but they don't believe in violence either. They want things to come to change, but they want to do it peacefully. They want workers to control the government. The workers are the important ones, so they should control the government. Government, now being the workers, would control industry. Therefore, the workers, in effect, would be controlling the industry. The workers are the ones making the money for these rich bosses. They should be treated better. Um, but this is kind of like um, what Karl Marx believed. He believed that the workers should be in control. But the difference is, and if you remember this from Global, he predicted that there would be a bloody revolution of this working class, the proletariat, and, um, and then they would take over. Whereas the opposite, the other extreme, anarchists believe in violence. Um, use violence to achieve your goals. So strikes started to happen. Again, some of these, some of these, the Homestead strike in particular, one of the most violent strikes in U.S. history. Homestead, Pennsylvania. It was a Carnegie steel plant. Carnegie, who did give a lot of money back to communities and society. Libraries, Carnegie libraries were a big thing. But the ones making them all this money that allowed them to give back, the workers weren't seeing that benefit. So they're angry, they go on strike. And it's one of the most violent strikes in history, that was before I go there. So what happens is this violence occurs, troops are sent in to try to curb the violence. Whose side do they take? They don't take the worker's side, they take the side of the big business. So this shows again the power, the pull that the business has. Um, government favors them. Pullman strike in Chicago, 1894. This was more peaceful. Um, it was led by a guy named Eugene Debs, who was a socialist, so it's nonviolent. But it's the Pullman, um, it was a Pullman sleeping car, it was a sleeping car on a railroad. Um, workers went on strike because their wages had been cut. And um, again, troops are sent in though by the national government. Why is this a national event? Well, it's a railroad. What do railroads do? They're, they go interstate and they deliver mail. So the federal office feels that they have have to do something. And again, I, I should I didn't mention how the Homestead strike ended either. Um, they both ended in favor of the big business. Workers did not get any gains. So Debs is the leader of the Socialist Party. Lawrence strike in Massachusetts, this comes further down the road, but I mention it here because it's a, it's a clothing play, uh, factory. And here, the workers do actually gain better wages and conditions. It's when it's become more of a national issue, things like the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire happen and gain attention, so things start to change. All right, completely different topic here to end the unit. Post-Civil War farmers. Okay. We know certain minority groups have suffered. We've talked 
more than once about the Native Americans. Um, you know, women at times, they had different races. But the group, and not that they're a minority group, but the group probably that suffers more than any in our country at different times in our history is the farmer. Early in the Civil War, as we're still, you know, manifest destiny and um, we're still trying to settle land going out west, some of the unsettled land, this was an attempt to do that. In 1862, it gave farmers land in the west for a minimal fee, simply for cultivating it for five years. It said, hey, if you move west, settle this land, you farm it for five years, it's yours. <coughs> or little or nothing. Oftentimes, they didn't have to pay anything. So again, this was a, an attempt to settle western lands. So a lot took advantage. They went there, but what they found was everything else was very expensive. Equipment, supplies. And so they're out here and not a lot of settled land between them and back east. Um, they have to transport their goods somehow to market, and they need the railroad to do that. Well, the railroad charged them huge fees. See, they really, they ripped the farmers off. And as I said in a previous lesson, they became the enemy. They get low prices for their crops, but you have to pay a ton to transport their crops. Um, before I explain this, another thing which was ridiculous, the farmers, the railroad would often charge them more to ship things a short distance than a long distance, which didn't make sense to the farmers. Farmers realized We've talked about this repeatedly throughout the course, too. Fighting as individuals was not going to do any good. So farm families came together in what was called the Granger Movement to try to get improvements done. Um, Grangers, they met and sometimes in Grange Halls. There is a Grange Hall in Norwich. It's on the back river road where you can turn right to go to Walmart. Um, Grange Hall right there, across from the, the um, car dealership, the Dodge dealership. So these groups, their main complaint was against the railroad. They were charged higher rates for short hauls than long hauls. They, they're going to have to make an even bigger movement here eventually, um, but their voices are starting to be heard. By 1887, the Interstate Commerce Act was passed, which did make rates fairer, if that's a word, um, or more fair, however you prefer. And then these Grangers formed an even larger group. They formed a political party. Because farm prices dropped again. The Populist Party. This is one where Enlightenment, John Locke, Alexander Hamilton think bank, populist party think farmers. If they ask about it, it's going to be about the farmers. So they form a political party. Started in 1890 with farmers from both the North and the South. Do they ever win an election? No. In fact, it doesn't last all that long. It kind of dies out. But things, a couple things do get passed. And um, so they do have importance. They want, this is one thing that eventually would come about. Not before they broke up, but it is because of them that it happened. They want a graduated income tax. Meaning, not everybody pays the same rate, but the higher the income you make, the larger percentage you pay. They also want government ownership of the railroad. They want to add silver money that would cause inflation and have more money available. Um, add, add silver to the gold standard. So that, again, because they're not making a whole lot of money, um, 
And, and that, that's the case now. That's why you know, people always say, why don't they just print more money? Well, if they did, if there was all this money available now, what's going to happen? Prices are just going to go up. So that's one of the drawbacks of minimum wage going too high. The minimum wage goes too high, prices just go up. <clears throat> but that's what they kind of want to happen. They said, we had money, we're going to make more money for our crops, but ultimately not really. Populist um, candidate who was also a Democratic candidate, his name was William Jennings Bryan, um, lost to William McKinley, but he was important though. He, he did speak out and a lot of populist party ideas did did survive. The party died in 1900, but the Republican and Democratic parties adopted some of the populist party ideas. So that's another regions type question. Question. The populist party is known as a third party movement. Third party, Democrat, Republican, populist. What's the importance of third party movements? Well, they might not last, but their ideas do. And they do get things accomplished. You're, we're going to see, not too long from now, um, another third party that comes about in the early 1900s. Teddy Roosevelt starts his own party known as the Progressive Party, or the Bull Moose Party. It's, it's, it's the same thing, Bull Moose was Teddy's nickname. So. The 16th Amendment came about, graduated income tax, which is what they had proposed. In the 17th Amendment, 1913, another idea <coughs> of the populace, the direct election of senators by the popular vote. Remember early in the course when I had you looking up information in the Constitution, one question was who chose senators prior to 1913. The state legislatures did because they didn't think that common man was smart enough. 